It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. I would never do that to you guys. It is a Wisdom Wednesday, and I'm fired up. It's going to be, I guess, on some level, somewhat similar to Monday's show, where I brought on Greg Gabriel and Adam Rank. And we sort of dove into the Chicago Bears, but really it was bigger than that. It was about roster building, the management of a young quarterback, expectations. And I thought it was fun to sort of hash out a tweet that had gotten a lot of attention, especially from Bears fans. So guess what? We're kind of doing something similar today because Saints fans have been all over my you-know-what. So the wisdom that will be dropped today on a Wisdom Wednesday will come from Nick Underhill. Big fan of Nick's work for years. You got to check him out on social media at Nick underscore Underhill from New Orleans dot football. Nobody covers the Saints better. We'll get to Nick momentarily. Look, tomorrow it'll be Greg Cosell on a teaching tutorial Thursday. And it'll be the last episode of the week already since we do three a week until week one of the NFL season, which means all you have to do today is the spread the word winner, just a five-star rating. That easy. Just five-star rating. I'm going to look and see someone that gives us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple or whatever. You'll be the winner. We'll have a sponsor confirmation email winner. I did see a couple sponsors came through. Love, love, love giving the YouTube shout-outs. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Just subscribe, comment. As soon as I see that, you got a great chance to get one of those cameo-style videos. We've got some really sad news from Arizona. We've got some big Deshaun Watson news as we move along. But first, it's Big Show time. The Big Show. All right, I mentioned earlier, it's like two minutes ago, but I told you about Nick. I uh, met Nick, I think, only once or twice, maybe at the Superdome. He's a Pennsylvania guy. I thought it was closer to me. Erie might as well be a different country. I mean, <laughs> Erie is far away. Uh, but, Nick, refresh my memory. You you were covering New Orleans. You went somewhere else, and then you came back to do your own thing. Yeah, I was covering uh, the Saints for the newspaper here. I took off to the Athletic for a year to cover the Patriots and then uh, just got up there and kind of realized that, my path was maybe a little bit different than other people's paths and climbing the ladder traditionally wasn't the thing that was going to make me happy. So I came back, started my own venture and uh, never been happier. I mean, it's, it's going well. And um, this is just kind of the team I want to cover. And I think you're kind of finding out about the, uh, the passion of the fan base and, you know, they're fun to work for, man. And, and they just kind of, you know, it's, it's family business down here and, and just their passion for the saints makes it fun every day to cover the team. So it's so interesting that you say that. So, I'm from outside of Philadelphia, Reading in particular. And, you know, we all know the way Eagles fans are. I have been amazed. And look, I love passion. Um, I, I think there is a point where it gets from like passion to maybe <laughs> delusional. I, I don't know. And I'm not putting all of the Saints fans in that category. But I'm glad to hear... Nick and I were talking before the show that you saw my comment. So I don't know how it started, but I was on the Rich Eisen show and they may, they probably just signed Tyron Matthew or they just signed Landry or somebody. And I guess here's my thought, Nick. Okay. I feel like the saints are around a 500 team. I, I would lean towards the over, like nine or ten wins. I don't see him winning seven games. I think eight's probably the low one. I think maybe nine or ten. Um, wouldn't shock me if they won 11, but I think probably nine or ten. I think they're around a 500 team. I think they're around what they were last year. What I think is interesting, and by the way, so do all the sports books. Like, forget me. Like, the people that actually set these lines and do this for a living – they have the Saints at eight, and I like the over. I mean, I, I like that. I think it's much more likely they win nine than win seven. So I feel like I'm like on the bright side of the Saints' win total at sports books. But 
looking at some of their moves, Nick, like signing Tyron Matthews, signing Jarvis Landry, trading up. We're trading with the Eagles next year's first round pick to get a first round pick with the Eagles this year. And then trading up from 16 to 11 to get Olave. My perception is that the Saints are behaving in a manner in which they think they're like a contender contender. I mean, like they think that they have a chance to really do something special this year. My comment was because of that, it appears if the Saints organization feels a lot better about their team and what they're going to do or what they could do this year than everybody else does. So I'm going to, that that's kind of laying the baseline for my followers or my listeners or whatever. They don't follow me on social media and Saints fans got real. Some guy I've never heard of or some website. It's evidently very popular. I don't know. Crew media or something. I'm sure I'm butchering it, but they, um, they posted it and then Saints fans have been going crazy. Yesterday I tweeted, yesterday I tweeted that um, school Nick should go from, it should start after Labor Day and finish by Memorial Day. One of the first tweets I got back was, at least you did more research on this than you did on the Saints. <laughs> <laughs> Which was incredible. All right. So what why are they so mad at me, Nick? And I, I don't I don't mean for you to be like speaking for them, but I can't get a thousand Saints fans on the show. What what am I missing? So I think where they would initially start is is probably point out that they started like 60-some different guys last year, still won nine games, had four different starting quarterbacks. Defense was one of the best in the league, probably should be better this year. Uh, last year's first-round pick only played a handful of games. Peyton Turner, he should be healthy and be back. Michael Thomas, theoretically, is coming back to be better. They started, you know, Kevin White, Kenny Stills, uh, Marquez Callaway was our number one wide receiver this year. It's it's going to be Mike Thomas, Jarvis Landry, Chris Olave. So I think on June first, theoretically, you look at everything and you lean towards optimism, and everything's going to work out perfect. You know, in the mind this point of the year. So I think you look at Jameis Winston and you and you say, well, he only you know threw two interceptions last year, and he's going to do this over the whole season. And you know, obviously, that's probably not going to happen. He's going to be a higher volume quarterback this year. They're going to lean on him more than they did a year ago. There's going to be more mistakes. But I do think that 500's maybe a little pessimistic. I, I said 10 wins, and they jumped on me too. And, and we're like, 10 wins? 10 wins? They won nine last year with all this stuff going on. So, look, they're playing a harder schedule. And I think that you do have to kind of veer towards a, a couple of the you know perfectly optimistic things not working out. So I think they're, they're probably a 10-win team. And a 10-win team can be a 12-win team if you get a couple lucky breaks, or it can go to eight if a couple things go against you. I mean, I just think that's that's the uh, the margin in the NFL, but I do think they're going to be a better team than they were a year ago. I mean, they really, really went through it last year with the injuries. They, you know, Ian Book started a game. Taysom Hill started a bunch of games. Trevor Simeon led them to a victory against the Bucs. I mean, a, a lot of things went against them last year. I think they do have pretty good character, but Sean Payton's not the coach of this team anymore either. That's something else that they they have to overcome. I think the national media has been way too pessimistic about Dennis Allen. Some of the things he's done here have been really incredible. I think he's really rehabilitated himself since uh, things didn't work out in Oakland. And you know some of the circumstances there with just sort of how things were run, I, I think weren't necessarily favorable for him. So I think being in a favorable situation He's, he's probably set up to do pretty well here, but losing Sean Payton, one of the best coaches in the NFL, like that's another one of those things you look at kind of optimistically on June 1st and think everything's going to work out, but that's a huge gap they got to figure out and fill in. And I think losing Sean probably is the difference between a win or a loss at least every year. So, I mean, I think you kind of got to veer a little bit towards caution on that one too. So I, I think 10 wins is kind of, kind of a fair place to put it in. If a couple of those things go right, it's 11. If a couple go wrong, I mean, I think, you know, eight, nine isn't, isn't completely out of the question. So one of the things I would respond to that, um, and I, I think every, I, I agree with pretty much everything you just said there. The re, What I'm hearing is people, you know, we talk about this on the Even Money podcast, which is the betting podcast. 
people should probably be putting a lot of money on the Saints season win total over. Now, you know, we're presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. And last time I looked, the number was eight. I don't know if it's gone up since then. Um, but it is interesting, Nick, because do you think it's I mean, obviously, do you think it's fair what I'm saying, which is that almost everybody you talk to nationally thinks they're around 500, maybe a little bit better, whatever. The Saints' actions, though, especially, Nick, trading next year's first-round pick to get this and, and, and uh, whatever it was, the third this year and the second in 2024, whatever it was with the Eagles, to get the 16th pick this year, that was eye-opening to me. And then they trade the third and fourth to go from 16 to 11. I mean, that what is it, five picks they traded to get Chris Olave, Nick? I, I don't think you do that unless you either really think he's a special player or you really think you have the potential to do something special. I mean, you talk to the organization. I've seen some of your tweets and your story. Like, you obviously have some impeccable sources. They clearly think they're pretty good and that they can make a run at this thing. Is that fair? Yeah, they do. I mean, and I, I think they look at the the NFC is kind of being wide open right now. And if you get into the playoffs, kind of anything can happen with this team. And look, they they did give up a lot to get Chris Olave. The thing I would say with that is if if he turns out to be, you know, a, a annual twelve hundred yard receiver or something, like no one's ever gonna remember what they gave up for him. You kind of just move beyond that. And look, the the market for wide receivers is is kind of crazy right now, the way these guys are getting paid and the positional value there is now as high as if not higher than than cornerbacks and they're up there with pass rushers i mean so top tier guys for a team that that's kind of been in a bad cap situation that wants to clear up their cap situation i see some of the logic there although you know i i do think that they paid a lot to get this guy so there's no leniency here like that move absolutely has to work out for it not to be viewed as is a major debacle uh a year or two from now but they do think that that they're a playoff team and you know, you go back to 2017 and the core players they drafted there, and now all those guys are on their second contracts, and guys like Demario Davis and Cam Jordan are getting later in their careers. They feel like their window's still right now, and they think that they can build a good enough team around Jameis Winston to where Jameis can kind of be a Ryan Tannehill type player that that's that's a game manager in some sense where everything isn't on his arm to win them games, can take some shots down the field, stay out of bad situations, and. If you do that, maybe you're you're right there on the on the cusp. But again, it, it's leaning towards that that optimism um, and kind of moving up those assets. Where we're just kind of the, was their thought process with that draft class, with where their team is. And if you don't take advantage of that right now in their mind, you know you're kind you've kind of wasted what you did in 2017 and all those guys being on their their second contracts and just waiting for all your assets to to vest in the future isn't going to help you with the guys that you have now. So. Look, next year too, there's seven guys that are supposed to be drafted at quarterback in the you know first 50 picks or whatever. There's going to be more movement. So if your quarterback this year doesn't work out and you want to hit the market again, maybe one of these guys that shakes free this year says, oh, I want to go to the Saints, and you can get your quarterback that way too. So I think they're just trying to stay competitive, keep their roster good, see if Jameis is a person that can lead them there. And if he's not, you're in a good position a year from now to maybe go out and get that quarterback that you need. Is any part of this, Nick, that they want to show they can win without Peyton? Is there any part of this that I don't want to say is personal, but is trying to make sure in year one without Sean that the culture and the standard stays at a certain level? I mean, I think it's important to to kind of maintain that, but I don't know if it's if it's necessarily Sean Payton driven. The draft w was an aggressive approach. They did replace Tron Armstead theoretically. They got Chris Olave, a huge need at wide receiver. But their other big moves came after the draft, and that was kind of sitting back and being shrewd, really, about how those prices played out. They didn't they didn't strongly go after Tyron Matthew. They kind of waited until his market fizzled to a point where they felt he was affordable, and they got him. It, $11 million isn't cheap, but that's not, you know, going after him week one of free agency. They got Jarvis Landry for $3 million, and, and that was just waiting until literally there was nothing left, nowhere for him to go. And 
they kind of presented an opportunity that that he chose to go to. So I don't think that they're, you know, seeking to to make a statement without Sean. I think they're just kind of doing what they always do. And I, I would argue that they've been more patient than in the past. I think the same aggressiveness is there, but like Sean, Sean's aggressiveness was like attacking. And you kind of saw that in their moves and where they're at now. It's kind of more of, you know, Mickey Loomis driven where, where you're sitting back and you still are doing everything you can to win, but it's not necessarily like pushing all the chips in on your first hand. It's, it's waiting for some hands to come and, and seeing how things fall and, and uh, attack them when it makes sense. So, um, you know, to me, they have questions at left tackle, head coach, and quarterback. Now, all of those might be end up being positive. The likelihood is, is that's unlikely. Those are three rough positions. I mean, those are those are three. I, I guess I would argue there's no more important two roles, probably an organization, than head coach and quarterback, which is why I think most people think they're around 500. People will believe it when they see it with Jameis Winston and Dennis Allen. And I think I think that's fair. I think they got to go out and prove it. And left tackle's a huge thing too. I mean, Toronto Armstead's missed a lot of games and they've shown they can win without him, but being completely without him is is it's different. And that's another thing they got to prove they can overcome. Alvin Kamara could be suspended early in the season. That's another thing that that could be a, a hit for for this team. They don't really have a tight end right now. Uh that that's proven himself so there's a lot of things that do have to go right for this team I, I understand somebody kind of looking at it you know and saying eight nine wins again I I think they're going to be a little better than that I, I veer towards optimism on some of these things but Mike Thomas is is also a huge question you know he hasn't really played in two years and I think he'll come back and, and be solid but does his game fit with Jameis you know Jameis hasn't done a lot of stuff over the middle that that's not his area of the field outside the numbers He's great, you know, out thrown to the sidelines. Mike Thomas is, is an over-the-middle type of wide receiver. Jarvis Landry does a lot of his damage over the middle. Jameis has made a lot of his mistakes over the middle. So can you marry these two things conceptually? Can Pete Carmichael cook up the offense that works right for Jameis? I, I think he will. But again, these are all things that they got to answer, and they're, they're rebooting without the guy that kind of defined everything that happened here. So – there are a lot of questions. There are a lot of things they got to overcome. And, you know, I don't know if it's automatically 11, 12 wins like a lot of Saints fans think. I think I think you you say, you know, again, 10. And there's a variance there where, okay, if these few things work out, it goes the right way. If they don't, it goes the other way. But, um, look, they pursued other quarterbacks in that. I mean, there's, there's not even the same confidence in him, you know, that, that the fans have in him. So I think uh, – I think it's fair to be to be um, cautious with where it's at. I do think, again, eight, given what they overcame last year, the fact that they got better at a lot of their key spots, I think that that's a tough number. But uh, it's not it's not insane to kind of look at it and, and wonder if some of these things aren't going to work out. So here's my last issue. Saints fans will be the first ones to tell you that Sean Payton is a Hall of Fame coach, right? Like, they love Sean Payton, okay? Gosh, you're trying to get me run out of town, man. No, I'm just saying, <laughs> no, no, you can't only really have it both ways, right? Like, they can't say he's a Hall of Fame coach on the one hand, and on the other hand, act like him being gone means nothing. That That, that does not seem logical to me. I thought Peyton was an outstanding coach. I thought the fact that he got that group and everything that happened to win nine games last year was amazing. And I guess I feel like Saints fans, it, it, they're the same ones that for years were saying he was the best coach, best coach, best coach, and now he's gone. It's like, oh, yeah, he, he Carmichael calls the plays yes. anyway. And it, it's like, I, that's not logical to me, Nick. No, it's not. And, and I think the the way that they've kind of talked about him since he left is is crazy. There's kind of this like thought process that somehow he was holding back the team, uh, and that's crazy. I mean, look, they assembled a poor roster last year on offense, and I think the thing that Sean kind of learned um, post Drew Brees is that maybe his system wasn't able to elevate everybody in the same way that that he thought it was. And Drew Brees was a big part of being able to bring in guys like Willie Sneed and turn him into a thousand yard receiver. And you needed more than just the playbook to make those kind of things happen. So 
I think they made huge mistakes with personnel. And I think that's where people kind of get confused and, and they start to undervalue him. And they say, well, okay, the, the offense was so bad last year. There weren't any players and now there's players. And so they'll be automatically better. And I, I agree with that to some extent. But it doesn't devalue Sean. I think a lot of the same moves that happened this year would have happened with Sean Payton here. I don't think that, you know, the word they like to use is he got arrogant. Like, I don't think that that this arrogance would have uh, or perceived arrogance would have really changed anything they did this offseason. I think a lot of the moves would have been the same. And he is one of the better coaches in the NFL. So it, it's not something that you can just kind of look beyond and, and assume. And I mean, look, man, you, you know, you would know this better than me. I think somebody like Sean that that brought an edge and kind of gave the team its personality, taking that out of the locker room, I think the next question is, is, does everybody stay on point the same way? Now, Dennis Allen has shown that his defense, you know, is organized and they pay attention to details and all that stuff, but still taking out the main guy from that, it's a question that has to be answered. And again, going back to the win total, I think it's fair to have those questions reflected in, in kind of where you're predicting where the team's going to go until they prove that, okay, Sean's gone. All these things still work, but there is a, a huge gap there, a huge shadow, and they got to find a way to get uh, from, from out from under it. Fun conversation. Really appreciate the time, Nick. Everybody needs to do this. Follow Nick on social media at Nick underscore Underhill. And then it's New Orleans dot football. I'm not aware of anyone that covers the team like Nick does. Uh, it's awesome. He does a great job, and I can see why you like it down there. It's unbelievable how passionate they are, how mad at me they got for what I thought was a somewhat innocuous comment. Uh, but, hey, that's what makes it great, right? We need fans to be passionate. We need them to care that much. I just like when 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 something's that extreme, I feel like I just need to like talk it out, make sure I'm not losing my mind here. Um, so I feel better about it, Nick. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was awesome. Uh, you know what else is awesome? LinkedIn jobs. Do you know you can create a free job post in minutes and reach your whole network, which mine's getting bigger, by the way. I'm on LinkedIn. You can link in with me. And beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to, and they do it faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn. That's bananas. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash Ross. That's linkedin.com slash Ross to get you to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. Tux takes. Hey Ross. Uh, well, let's start with Deshaun Watson news. 23rd civil lawsuit was filed against him after that uh, HBO real sports episode aired. So not good. And that's the thing that's got to be the most concerning to the Browns and the NFL. And I know his, his uh, lawyer came out and spoke out against this woman that made this, that filed this lawsuit and said a bunch of things about her. I guess the point I would make is even when it's over, it's not really over, right? Like even after the NFL – gives him whatever punishment he's going to get, and the legal system is done. How do you know others, other cases won't come out or other news won't come out? That's got to be the part that really scares you if you're the NFL and the Cleveland Browns. Tux takes. Some heartbreaking news out of Arizona where Cardinals cornerback Jeff Gladney uh, passed away from a car accident, age 25. It was Jeff and a female. I think it was very late Sunday night. Awful. Former first-round pick at a TCU for the Minnesota Vikings. Just absolutely awful. Don't know the details. Doesn't matter. Anytime 
anyone loses their life, especially that young, especially with that kind of opportunity, it uh, it hurts your heart. Tux takes. Tampa Bay Buccaneers signed D tackle Akeem Hicks. One year is a deal worth up to ten million dollars. That guy is a beast. I mean, that guy is a physical monster and beast. And the thought of him and Vita Vea bull rushing against guards, that is scary. Very scary. Good luck to the guys against them. Now, he's gotten uh, beat up a lot. He's had trouble staying healthy. And it seems like it'll be Hicks instead of Sue. Maybe Sue doesn't want to play or they weren't offering enough money or whatever. I kind of thought Sue would be back. But maybe the Bucks didn't want to wait anymore. Tux takes. Aaron Donald uh, looking for a new contract and is, quote, at peace with retiring if he doesn't get it. So, stuff like this always makes me laugh, by the way. I mean, hopefully this is one of the reasons why you guys listen or watch the Ross Tucker football podcast. He's going to get a new contract from the Rams. Okay? Like, that is going to happen. All of this is just posturing. Uh, I don't know when he'll be there. I don't know how much money it'll be, but they'll figure it out because the Rams want to continue the success they had last year, especially, you know, trying to win the hearts and minds and souls of all the fans in Los Angeles. You can't walk away from Aaron Donald. And by the way, you really can't pay Allen Robinson and then not pay Aaron Donald and Cooper Cup. Tux takes. The charges against uh, Jerry Judy, Broncos wide receiver, were dropped. That's good news. Uh, You know, I think a lot of times we don't talk about stuff like this. It's like the charges come out and we mention that, but then when they're dropped, we never really – Talk about them. You got to talk about when the charges get dropped as well. You also got to talk about how I can't wait for a bunch of you to send me a five-star rating today and be the spread the word winner as a result. Screenshot it. Send it to me, Ross at RossTucker.com. You can do it right when the show's over, just real quick, or do it for one of the other shows. I don't care. Send it to me. You can be the spread the word winner tomorrow. Five-star rating, Spotify or Apple Podcast. Let's do a quick email, Brian. Ever wanted to ask an NFL player a question? Well, here's, here's your, your chance. chance. It's time to ask Ross. Email address, Ross at Ross Tucker.com. Whatever you want to get at me for. You want to be a patron. You want to, you want me for a speaking engagement, sponsor confirmation, email, whatever. Ross at Ross Tucker.com. What do you got, Brian? Uh, we got one from Tommy Kraft who asks, hey, Ross, do you ever wish that your career would have been longer than the seven years in the NFL that you were blessed with? Ooh, that's an interesting question, Tommy. Very interesting right now because I'm I'm having some orthopedic issues, unfortunately. My neck that ended my career is bothering me. My right knee is bothering me. Um I guess the answer is, Tommy, it really depends. I mean, I certainly wish I would have made more money, of course. I would have loved to have seen what would happen with my career if I didn't have the back surgery in Buffalo or if it didn't end with the herniated disc and bruised spinal cord in my neck against Baltimore in 07. I kind of would have liked to play double digits, Tommy. I, I, I kind of would have liked to have been able to say I played 10 years. However, 10 years, three more years, that's even more orthopedic issues. And with everything, all the research I do with CTE, three more years of, you know, hits to the head? Probably not, man. I like my life the way it is now. So probably not. Really good question. Interesting question. Please keep them coming. Ross at RossTucker.com. Shout outs, of course, Evergreen Economics, Go-Bangles.com, SteakhouseSports.com, HumanHeadNYC.com, Sportaculture, and Pizza Boy Brewing. I think we're done here. 
Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.